Allergy and Asthma Network presents our Five Things to Know webinar series to share thoughts about issues that are important to patients and providers. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network, and today we're going to be looking at five things to know about asthma, about anaphylaxis in the school setting, part two. So the five things to know for today are, we're going to look at student needs, we're going to look at 504 plans, legal rights and requirements, 504 accommodations, student care plans, and resources for schools and nurses. So that's kind of our, our agenda for the day here. For those of you that don't know me, I spent most of my career as a school nurse. I know what it's like to worry about all the potential sources for allergen exposure in the school setting. And I know what it's like to really worry about students that you've really come to care for and about. My career path included years at a health office desk in elementary and secondary schools, as well as private and public schools. I have also served as executive director for the New York Statewide School Health Services Center, and I was a director of nursing education for the National Association of School Nurses. I'm proud to be part of Allergy and Asthma Network, and this year we're celebrating our 35th year of supporting patients and families. We are a grassroots patient advocacy organization with a mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. We do this by working with experts in the field of allergy and asthma. And today we welcome a lawyer who is an expert in his field, and he's gonna be with us to discuss uh, issues and student civil rights on the subjects of food allergy and anaphylaxis. So this is Ryan Gambala. He is a director at O'Toole, McLaughlin, Dooley, and Pecora in Cleveland, Ohio, and chairman of the firm's Food and Beverage Industry Practice Group. He regularly advises restaurants, manufacturers, individuals, and families on the legal implications of allergens and allergies in the food service industry. In addition, Ryan represents several public school districts and counsels them on student safety issues including those related to food allergies. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for joining us for today's conversation. Thank you, Sally. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of it. Oh, we're, we're excited to hear from you today. But first, we have a couple other things to talk about. Uh, when we discuss the questions in legal matters today, uh, we're really going to be looking at uh, our, our best practices that we know and personal experience. We can't make a judgment on specific cases. So I want to just remind you that each school nurse must exercise independent professional judgment when assimilating anything into your practice. Because nurse practice acts are very different from state to state, you have to remember that you must ensure that anything related to practice is consistent with your applicable state laws and regulations, including those governing delegation, as well as school district policies and procedures. So we hope you find this information helpful. Please remember we're not outlining a full allergy and anaphylaxis management program in this webinar. This is a piece of the pie, and but we're just gonna touch on a few of the aspects. So just please keep those things in mind as we go. So I'm gonna start today and just talk a little bit about student needs. And we wanna just talk a little bit about what does a student need who is at risk for anaphylaxis. So. Uh, one second. Okay, here we go. I just want to remind you, I always like to put up the framework for 21st century school nursing practice that we, we developed when I was at NASN. And just to remind you that, uh, you know, allergy management is all a part of all of these aspects of the framework. So to have a full allergy management program at your school, you have to keep in mind you need to be doing planning and coordination of care, you need to be educating staff, students, and parents, you need to be providing a safe environment and be able to mount a prompt emergency response when needed. So part of providing a safe environment is that you wanna reduce allergen exposures in order to prevent reactions. If we could avoid every allergen exposure, then we would never have to worry about emergency care. It's a little unrealistic. So we do make sure that we understand that those routes of exposure are oral, skin, and inhalation and we do have to plan to respond to anaphylaxis. You should have a building-wide plan, and then you should have individual plans for your students. So when we're talking about oral exposure, uh, what are we talking about? 
you know, we're talking about the fact that allergens, hidden ingredients, and cross-contact, and most of these allergic reactions actually start in the classroom. Everybody thinks the cafeteria is going to be the biggest problem, but, but data and experience has told me it's the classroom. So when you're thinking about younger students, I mean, they are passing saliva a lot of the day. And uh, they do need supervision during meals and snacks. But think about how many times a younger child puts their hands in their mouths. Uh, if they have any kind of contaminant, if they have an allergy and they've just barely got it on their hands, having it on their hands isn't the problem. The problem is that the hands go in the mouth. And when you're thinking about older students, this is uh, equally difficult to, to take care of because they're into risk-taking behavior, peer pressure, bullying, and yes, even kissing can be a problem with food allergies. So labels must be read, and you should make sure that you're offering a student a meal without an allergen. And you want to make sure that there's assistance for students with choices when that student needs it. Every student is in a different spot, uh, not only uh, cognitively, but developmentally. So you never think about age, you have mm -hmm. to think about who is that child. You want to make sure that around a food allergic child that there's no sharing of food, or drink, or utensils, and that there isn't any unlabeled food that's being offered. Uh, Non-food celebrations are the best ticket when it comes to having a school celebration for a birthday or holiday or something. Uh, the food can, can just be a problem. So you want to make sure that you have strategies to avoid, avoid cross-contact. And you want food-free classrooms only when necessary. Uh, we really need to help children understand how to manage their allergy and how to stay away from allergens because uh, that's part of real-world education. And, uh, and it's, it's just very important to keep that in mind. And it's also important to do periodic check-ins with students and staff. I used to try to get to school early enough to do um, rounds in the morning. Uh, I'd do it like I'd, I'd visit a couple of classrooms in the morning and chat with the teachers about the students in their classes. And one second grade, grade classroom I went into, the teacher had one of my most severely allergic children. This child had CPR twice before he came to kindergarten. And she is getting ready for this, the, the project of the day. And I was doing everything I could not to gasp. And I said, what, what, what are you working on here? And she goes, oh, we're going to roll pine cones in peanut butter and birdseed today. And I was just kind of like, uh, you know, I wanted to go, what are you thinking? But I didn't help. I held my tongue. I said, well, let's talk a little bit about how that would go for Riley and, and his allergy. And she goes, but we, he's not going to be eating it. And I thought, I thought I did a better job of training. But, uh, but we did have to talk about how, what, how that was just too ripe a situation for an oral exposure for him even though you know she wasn't serving it as food. So the another thing we want to watch about is skin exposure. In a situation where there's isolated contact on skin that's intact, you're not going to see a severe or systemic response. Uh, skin reactions are, are minimal with food allergies, but both children and adults touch their eyes, nose, and mouth regularly. So when you wanted to keep skin clean, please keep in mind that soap and water is just the best. Commercial hand wipes are okay. Hand sanitizer is not okay. We're certainly using it in this day of COVID like it's going out of style, but it's not something that's going to uh, uh, get rid of an allergen. It's just going to spread it around. So you want to think also about non-edible items that might contain some food allergens. Finger paint sometimes has, uh, has allergens in it. Play-Doh, shaving cream, sometimes lactose is hiding in very interesting spots. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, chewing gum dusts it with lactose, and it's like you would think that that wouldn't be a milk allergy issue, yet it is. So for young children, always keep in mind that skin exposure can quickly become mucosal or oral exposure, and hand washing, hand washing, and hand washing is good for more than just viruses. It's good for allergies as well. Inhalation. This one becomes a little bit of a controversial issue at times. Uh, what causes the allergic reaction in inhalation is the aerosolized proteins, not the odor. So you might smell something, but if there are no aerosolized proteins, that's not really going to cause an allergic reaction. However, 
uh, aerosolized protein. Some people have, have reported having a, um, a allergic reaction if they're like allergic to shrimp and they're leaning over the pot and it's boiling up at them. They, uh, they have uh, reported anaphylaxis in situations like this. So always keep in mind too that science experiments involving burning or heating of allergens can create risk. And use caution when cooking with food, flowers, powders, and other particles that like go up in the air. And so uh, whenever you can, you want to avoid food in the curricular classroom or any activities that you're doing. Uh, try to find another way to, to create the, the scientific uh, situation that you want to have that doesn't include food. Now, field trips. I, I, I doubt that if there's a, a, a good school nurse audience here today that they haven't agonized over field trips. It's kind of a minefield of issues for students with food allergies. Not only what might be served, but what the activities are and more. So some children, are go you're going to need to assess uh, from the school, from, from your standpoint, to make sure that you have special accommodations in place. And as Ryan's going to back up later, the law says that all students go on a field trip or nobody goes on the field trip. And, uh, and there's ways to, to do that creatively, but, uh, but that's, that's the way that law goes. You can't just say, we'll keep this child back. So keep in mind students' developmental skills when you're thinking about how they can handle their allergy. In early elementary, they're gonna depend on the adults around them and learn to, they need to learn and trust and communicate with their caregivers. They get towards upper elementary, they should be learning to recognize their own symptoms and either request or be able to even begin to use their own meds. In middle school, they should be able to develop a medication routine. And teens should be really responsible for, for being able to give them themselves their meds. And older teens, we want desperately to train these kids to be able to self-manage so that they can go out in the world on their own. I have a very good friend who was a school nurse of high school kids. And whenever a child needed an epinephrine auto injector, she would have them sit in a chair so they were knee to knee with her. And she'd put her hand over theirs and give the epinephrine so that they got used to um, being able to give it or at least have the feel that they were giving it themselves. And then she could help hold the hand close to the leg so that it didn't just pop out with that little recoil that it gets. When you're looking at plans for your whole school, the Food Allergy Management and Prevention Plan that's on page 44 of the CDC Voluntary Guidelines is a great plan to look at. Assess your school, see what you've got in place and, uh, and what, you, what you need to get in place. Uh, and this link is also on the handout that's uh, available with this webinar. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about four major types of healthcare plans. We're going to talk about individualized healthcare plans or IHPs emergency care plans, or ECPs. Uh, Ryan's gonna be talking mostly about Section 504 plans, and we will touch on individualized education plans, or IEPs. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan. Thank you, Sally, and thanks to the Allergy and Asthma Network for letting me be a part of today's webinar. Uh, I was excited when I was approached about the presentation today because it's not all that often that the two focuses of my legal practice are part of the same presentation. Like Sally said at the beginning, uh, my practice focuses primarily on two subjects. One is food safety, uh, including food allergens, and the other is representing public school districts here in the, the state of Ohio where my office is. Um, and so I'm excited to speak with you guys today uh, about those two things together in the context of 504 plans. Uh, as a lawyer, I feel it's my obligation to issue some of those legal disclaimers that everybody gives at the beginning of presentations, and so I'm going to do that now. Uh, one is that this is not legal advice, and it doesn't create an attorney-client relationship between us. I expect most of you know that, but it's one of the disclaimers that, that we're obligated to give. The other uh, is that I want you all to understand that I'm going to be touching on some topics that I think are important or that I see with some frequency in my practice, but I am not giving a comprehensive overview of all of the issues related to 504 plans or all of the issues related to food allergies uh, in, the, in the school setting. And so just uh, be aware of that, that this is some important issues, but, but by no means everything. And so with, with that in mind, um, 
kind of the, the roadmap for my presentation is going to be first speaking about uh, 504 plans and the, the rights and requirements under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, what it is, who's eligible, and what accommodations are supposed to do and what they're not really supposed to do. And then in the second part of my comments, um, I'll be talking about some specific accommodations or specific issues related to food allergies and kind of how those look in a real world setting. And so uh, as the introduction slide says here, um, Section 504 uh, provides that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability shall solely by reason of her disability his or her disability uh, be excluded. And so a couple of things uh, that I think are important about that language to understand. One is that this is a federal statute and it applies to entities that accept federal funds. That includes all of our public school districts and other public offices, but it does also include some private school districts that accept federal funds. Now there are some private schools that don't for whatever reason, um, but if they accept federal funds, Section 504 of the, the Rehabilitation Act applies there. Um, the, in the school setting, kind of the, the driving force of 504 is the, the free appropriate public education. I'm sure we've all heard of FAPE uh, at one point or another. Um, the idea is that we're not going to deny students a free appropriate public education um, just because they suffer from a disability. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to take some steps to try and put them on a level playing field with their peers. Um, we talk about the, the old adage uh, for lawyers that deal with these issues is that um, they call it the Chevy, not the Cadillac. The idea is we might not be obligated to give potential maximizing uh, accommodations under Section 504, but we are obligated to level the playing field for those students. And so moving forward then to uh, food allergies, uh, the question is, well, hey, if, if this applies to disabilities, what about food allergies specifically? Are they covered under Section 504? And the answer to that question is not always, but where a food allergy can cause a life-threatening reaction, um, it does qualify as a disability. And I think in general practice, it, it's pretty rare um, to find a a real diagnosed food allergy that that would not qualify uh, under Section 504. You know, they adopt a lot of the the more traditional Americans with Disabilities Act language, where they talk about disabling conditions impacting major life activities. Uh, breathing is a major life activity by federal law, and so you know, allergies that could result in anaphylaxis uh, would be disabling and also life-threatening. Eating and learning are also major life activities under federal law. And so ultimately, it's an individual inquiry um, made by a 504 team. And so depending on individual circumstances, you may or may not have a food allergy that qualifies. Most often, they do. Um, and so that's something that's important to be aware of. The other thing is that, you know, the 504 team uh, is going to be making decisions. And so it's not up uh, to, you know, one 504 coordinator or one uh, SPED coordinator, but it's up to the team to determine uh, what condition exists and what accommodations are appropriate. Uh, so what about eligibility? Um, what's considered in determining if a student is eligible for 504 accommodations. Uh, like I say there at the, the top point, most often the schools receive referrals from parents, uh, can come from others, usually certainly in the, the food allergy context, it's from parents through doctors. I, I guess one thing to remember about 504 is it's tied to federal funding. And so the federal law puts a, an obligation on schools and others to seek out people that might qualify for 504 accommodations and do an evaluation and make them aware uh, that there are accommodations available to them um, if they qualify under Section 504. And so that's kind of some of my middle points there uh, on the slide. If the, if the school doesn't agree to evaluate a student at the request of a, a parent, that parent uh, does have a right uh, to a due process hearing where they could take it up. That's an administrative hearing uh, within the school and the Board of Education before a parent could file a lawsuit 
Um, and look, oftentimes those things are helpful uh, if there's a, a question about whether or not a student should be evaluated um, for 504 eligibility. On the, there we go. On the next slide, I'm talking. Uh, right, can we go back one more, please? Thank you. Um, so just understand that uh, part of 504 evaluations can include medical testing and other testing. To the extent that that testing is done, uh, that is done at no cost to the family. That is a uh, cost that, that would be borne by the school district. Um, so if a district were challenging whether or not they thought a food allergy could cause a life-threatening reaction and they wanted a student evaluated, the district would have to pick up the cost for that. Um, one thing that's important to know about 504 evaluations is that in evaluating a student uh, for eligibility, you cannot consider mitigating measures. And so things like inhalers and epinephrine uh, can't be considered in determining whether or not a condition, a food allergy could cause a life-threatening reaction. The only exception to the mitigating measures rule that I can think of is, is eyeglasses, um, but certainly uh, bronchodilators and auto-injectors cannot be considered uh, when determining whether or not a student is eligible for 504 accommodations. And so if he is eligible to participate, he or she, then she is entitled to accommodations. And so that leads into my slides on what accommodations should and should not do. Uh, like I said at the beginning, um, the idea under Section 504 is to give uh, disabled students a free appropriate public education. And so they're to receive education as adequately uh, as their non-disabled peers is the way the, the law describes it. But it's the idea, like I say, is um, leveling the playing field. I think I've got it there on the second point, as adequately uh, as the needs of non-handicapped persons. And so uh, it's important to know that providing FAPE um, and making accommodations under Section 504 is an individualized inquiry. It depends on that student and what that student's disabilities are and what what food allergies they have and, and how severe they are and how they manifest themselves and so forth. And so sometimes in my practice, I hear school administrators or others talk about, um, now we've got so-and-so on the peanut plan. And I always cringe a little bit when I hear that and I let them know that, look, it, it could be that, that the plan for every student is the exact same, but keep in mind that when we're evaluating those students, we're doing an individual inquiry and some students may need greater accommodations than others based on a myriad of things, their own condition, classroom conditions, transportation needs, extracurriculars, so forth and so on. And so that is an individualized inquiry. Um, but again, the idea is to have the needs of disabled students met the same as, as non-disabled peers. And so that's, um, different than a individualized education plan. Uh, individualized education plans or IEPs are focused on special ed generally. Um, and that educational program is often tailored to that individual student. Under a 504 plan, we're talking about making accommodations for a student so that that student can participate alongside his non-disabled or non-food allergic peers. Uh, last slide, or last point there is just free means without cost, like I said earlier, except fees that would be imposed on non-disabled students. So we can't bill uh, students for having 504 plans or needing to be evaluated and so forth. Uh, same rule applies in non-academic settings like the cafeteria and field trips. I think Sally touched on that a little bit earlier and we'll walk through um, what some accommodations can look like in those settings later on, but it's not, it isn't a matter of just kind of getting through math class. Uh, there's more to a free appropriate uh, public education than just sitting in a classroom. Uh, equal opportunity to participate. Uh, we touched on that. Um, where a student or his family, his or her family, doesn't feel like FAPE is being provided, that's another opportunity for them to make a due process challenge uh, with the district 
in terms of the accommodations that the school district is willing to make for that student. And that, you know, look, the, that candidly is where I see a lot of um, a lot of issues arise, where a, a school will recognize a food allergy, make accommodations for that student, and a parent is maybe asking for more, asking for things that the district can't do, and that's where you can get some friction uh, between school district uh, and student in terms of uh, whether FAPE is being provided, whether the accommodations that the district is offering are enough for that individual student. So uh, what accommodations should do? Uh, accommodations should be necessary um, for that student, the one with food allergies, that disabled student, to equally participate in educational activities. Um, affirmatively enhance the disabled plaintiffs. In this case, this is a quote from a uh, court case, quality of life by ameliorating the effects of the disability. Um, you know, accommodation is reasonable unless it requires a fundamental uh, alteration in the nature of a program or imposes an undue fi financial and administrative burden. I will tell you, um, that's an individual inquiry, but I will tell you this. If the only reason your public school district, at least in Ohio and I imagine elsewhere, does not want to put a 504 plan accommodation in place is because of cost, it is going to be a long and expensive road to hoe um, because courts are generally not going to hear that. Um, there are reasons to not put accommodations in place. If it's just cost, I encourage my school district clients to go back and rethink that. Um, school has the burden of proving that an accommodation is unreasonable. So that's an important point. Um, maybe it sounds like a legal technical point, but what I mean there is ordinarily, if a, if a plaintiff is, is filing a lawsuit, bringing a claim, that plaintiff has the, the burden of proving the elements of their claim. Uh, when it comes to 504 plans and accommodations and FAPE and so forth, it, that burden is somewhat reversed. If a parent sues a school district for not making a 504 plan accommodation that they've requested, the district is going to have the burden of proving that the requested accommodation uh, is unreasonable. So when are accommodate when are uh, when are accommodations are are not required? Uh, and this is um, kind of like what I was saying earlier. They they talk about, hey, the, the school district has an obligation to provide a Chevy, but not a Cadillac. That's the analogy that gets thrown around. Um, and that comes from the notion that a school is not required uh, to provide a potential maximizing education. Um, students have to be otherwise qualified to meet an educational program's requirements. Um, in school districts don't have to modify clinical training requirements. Now, understand some of those uh, quotes, particularly the last one, uh, these are things that often come up in the context of disabilities, but not necessarily food allergies. You know, modifying curriculum and program requirements uh, when it comes to food allergies in a classroom setting we're not necessarily looking for those kind of changes. I know to, to give some examples, I've seen cases where uh, a blind student wanted a curriculum change uh, that would eliminate the need to do a practical exam. I think he was in a chiropractic college or uh, somewhere like that. It was an advanced education setting. It wasn't K through 12, but the um, the court said, well, look, we, you know, we understand why you want that accommodation, but that's not something um, that we're going to require that that university or that institution to do. The practical component of the education can't be modified in that way. Um, th those are not things that that often come up, um, like I say, in, in the context of food allergies, and so that's important to be aware of. So I've got just a couple of real world examples here, um, some cases that uh, kind of highlight the things that I've been talking about. The first couple um, are where the Office of Civil Rights 
uh, intervened on behalf of students and families. Um, the first one where they just weren't going to recognize um, uh, peanut allergy as a disability. Uh, that didn't work for that school district, I can tell you that. Um, and when the Office of Civil Rights gets involved, you really need to take a close look at what you're doing uh, and make sure that there isn't something you missed in making those determinations. The second case uh, in Ray Bethlehem Central School, uh, this is an interesting one. A student with food allergies wanted to enroll, enroll in a culinary arts class. Um, school had some apprehension, had some heartburn over that, and the family provided a release from their family and a recommendation from a doctor that the student be entitled to participate. Those are things that ordinarily would not be required but were offered in that case. Um, school district still did not want to allow that student to participate and once again the Office of Civil Rights got involved and said no, uh, that student has a right to FAPE like everybody else. Um, you're going to enroll them in that culinary arts program and it, it speaks a little bit to the, the point Sally made earlier about this not just being a, a a classroom setting, a sitting at a desk setting. The free appropriate public education applies to all components of public ed, whether it's classroom, extracurricular field trips, uh, and so on. Now, the last case there, TF versus Fox Chapel, um, that was one where a family requested accommodations. Ultimately, some were rejected by the school district. The family sued. And the court found in favor of the school. Uh, and what's interesting, if you look at the, the TF case, the school offered at least three 504 plans, each one more comprehensive than the last, in an effort to kind of meet the, the requirements or the request that that family was putting forward. The Ultimately, the the straw that seemed to break the camel's back in that case. It's not one that I was involved in, but what, what seemed to be the central issue was that the family wanted all teachers that were going to interact with that student to be uh, trained to administer epinephrine. Um, the school district was going to provide uh, nurses and uh, some teachers and other people to do that, but was not going to train everybody. And they had other part or components of a 504 plan to keep that student safe. And the, the court in that case said that that was enough. So the, the second part of my presentation um, is focused on, like I say, um, kind of some specific or real world kind of examples of, of how to make 504 accommodations work in a, in a school setting and some of the issues that we encounter. And, Things to so do Ryan, or ideas. Ryan, real quick, Ryan, real quick. Between the two of us, we want to speak for about ten more minutes, just to let you know where we're at in the, in the hour. Okay, I, I, thank you, and I will. Uh, I will try and move it along. You know, lawyers, we can never stop talking. But um, I didn't say that. <laughs> look, the, gen, generally speaking, you know, there's usually a 504 template. If you're a, a parent and you want to look at one, you can get one from your school most often. Uh, staff has to follow the uh, school's food allergy policies. Here in Ohio, you know, we've got a state statute that requires a food allergy policy for peanuts and other food allergens, uh, requires a board and a superintendent to have a policy on that that the staff's trained to follow. Um, there should be training provided either by a school nurse or, or by an outside agency that's qualified, but training for staff um, to recognize symptoms and how to administer treatment if that's part of their obligation and if they have the appropriate certifications. Again, in Ohio, um, you can, in the school setting, uh, you can get certifications if you're a teacher or, or other school personnel that would be required to administer that kind of life-saving medication. And last, keeping uh, epinephrine and so forth in a secure, accessible area. I have a note there, what about self-carry? Um, again, in Ohio, we self-carry is mandatory if a uh, if the family, student, and doctor sign off on it, um, there, there's other steps involved, but you should look into your own uh, state law on that. But in Ohio, you know, self-carry is becoming the norm, particularly uh, in high school. Uh, okay, events and field trips. 
consistent with food allergy policies. It's kind of the idea that Sally put forward earlier, which is either uh, everybody goes or nobody goes, or we go, we do something else that can accommodate a food allergy. So sometimes it's just a, an alternative um, access to medications, including auto injectors and train how to use them, hand washing uh, before and after handling and eating food. We talked about that. Uh, trans Okay, self-carry. I kind of touched on this a bit. Um, if you're authorized to self-carry in Ohio, you have to self-carry. Uh, it's, it's not optional. Um, the other thing just to think about is shelter in place. Uh, I, I put this in my slides. Um, nowadays, you know, we all have to do the active intruder drills, um, active shooter drills and so forth. And if students have to shelter in place for extended periods of time, it's important to have food available that those with food allergies can eat. Transportation, the idea that a reaction can happen on the bus. Uh, we should have policies against eating and drinking on the bus. Uh, diabetic students certainly accept it. Um, but those providing transportation to students on a food allergy 504 plan should be trained on how to respond if an emergency arises. Uh, that classroom accommodations, you know, make sure substitutes are in the loop if a student has food allergies. Um, food as a reward and so forth should be avoided. Um, try and use, uh, you know, non-food incentives. If you like, the um, same holds true for classroom celebrations. It's on the the next slide there, the, the same kind of idea that if we're celebrating something, try and use non-food items. If you are using food, check for uh, allergens in the label and advisory warnings. Desks, tables, and chairs should be sanitized after celebrations. You know, that's we certainly hope that that happens. We instruct uh, our staff to make sure that that happens, but it's important and it's not in a cafeteria setting. Like we said earlier, uh, we don't exclude a student because of a food allergy the same way we would not exclude a student because a student was in a wheelchair. Um, make sure meals and snacks are appropriately packaged to avoid cross contact. Parents uh, should be invited, but not required to come. Um, if they want to participate, certainly they should, should be able to, um, but we're not gonna kind of put our obligation on them. Uh, th this is just speaking about educating students on food allergies as, as appropriate for their age. And if we have, if bullying occurs related to food allergies, we should make sure to follow our disciplinary plan on that. Um, the next slide speaks to cafeteria accommodations. I think we're probably all somewhat uh, familiar with cafeteria accommodations, but the idea is, um, you know, having uh, allergen friendly tables uh, and a system in place to identify students with food allergies. Um, if we could maybe skip ahead two slides to cafe the next slide, please. There we go. Uh, if, if school meal if school meals are required, um, you know we want to uh, make sure that we're reading labels. Ingredients uh, do change to things we've ordered over time. You should check ingredients every time something comes in. Um, menus uh, should be sent to students with food allergies in advance. Um, so that uh, the parents can review them and make sure that their student is safe. Uh, the last slide really talks about phys ed um, and the idea of having uh, access to life-saving medication bronchodilators and auto injectors available in that setting where things can happen. The last couple of slides, I had some sample uh, 504 plans. We don't have to go through those. I know we're a little tight on time. I, I will tell you, uh, I can give my email address at the end. I, I do have a sample plan from the U.S. Department of Education, their Office of Civil Rights, tailored specifically to food allergies. It's got some years on it now in terms of format and so forth, but substantively um, it deals specifically with food allergies, so sometimes that can be a good launching point. But with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Sally. Thank you. I apologize if I ran over. That's okay. No, we just both have a lot to say today. It's a great topic. So thank you so much for your words. 
My so I'm is. just going to touch on care plans. Uh, they, they, if you look in your scope and standards of school nursing practice, you will see that standard number four is planning. And it says a school nurse develops an individual plan in partnership with the student and others. So this is something we all need to be doing. The benefits of writing care plans are that they demonstrate that standard of practice. They document the nursing process. This is the greatest value of a school nurse in my, in my estimation, is that she brings or he brings the nursing process to the school to every student interaction. It does provide legal documentation. It can clarify your clinical practice and it does becomes the foundation for the health portion of every other kind of educational or emergency plan. This is an example of an individualized health care plan that the National Association of School, school, uh, school Nurses put out. I just want to show you very quickly how the nursing process fits into the care plan. You've got your assessment, diagnosis and goals. You've got outcomes, implementation and evaluation. So right there shows you that what you know with the nursing process becomes the foundation for your care plan. So an IHP, an Individualized Healthcare Plan, is a nursing document that's written in nursing language for nurses to use. This is not going to be something you're going to put in a simpler language. You're going to be able to write this in your nursing language as a tool to communicate with other nurses. I used to always stamp on my IHPs uh, part of permanent health record. So if a student changed schools, their IHP went with them and the new nurse was not starting in a deficit situation. And sometimes kids disappear overnight to other schools. An emergency care plan uh, outlines the emergency care that you need, know needs to be given for this child. This is gonna be based on the provider's orders and it's gonna be written in lay language to guide non-medical staff to respond to an emergency. So you wanna think about someone who's nervous reading an emergency care plan and being able to react. So any child that has severe or life-threatening medical condition like risk for anaphylaxis needs to have an ECP. I always thought to myself if they had epinephrine, they needed an ECP. This is the American Academy of Pediatrics Emergency Care Plan. I love this document. So think about this, but the highest priority uh, uh, for the safety of students uh, should be those with the life-threatening health conditions. You want to be able to provide the safe environment, and this helps to notify people who have a legitimate need to know and I've got the web address for you right down there. But this is an absolutely exemplary form in my estimation. And we're also, when, as we think about that ECP, remember that's a document written by a school nurse in lay language for a non-medical school staff member to follow. When you're looking at an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan, as Ryan agreed as, with me as well, these are very rarely used for food allergies. It would only be used for food allergies if another disability existed. So if they were uh, learn, um, you know, learning uh, ment emotionally impaired or uh, they had a, 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 me a mental health issue, this might go on the education IEP as other health impaired. But, uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is if there is an IEP, don't ever attach your IHP to it. An IHP should be a fluid document, and the IEP is written by the Committee on Special Education in a district and can only be changed when you go back to the committee to change it. So what you want to make sure if they need to have an IHP for an IEP, you have it just written that an IHP is on file in the school health office. So the IEP is that written statement of special education program designed to meet a child's individual needs. And you won't see that too often. So we're gonna just move really quickly through these resources. There is a handout, it will be posted on our website as right next to where the, the webinar is, as well as, uh, and it's got all the web addresses, but I just wanted to show you some good resources. CDC has voluntary guidelines for managing food uh, allergies both in schools and early care education programs. The full document has that burgundy title at the top and there's other guidance and PowerPoints for things that you need to know for schools. Uh, FAME is a fabulous program. It's out of the St. Louis Children's Hospital. It ha it's color coded. I'm a sucker for color coding, but it has different sections for unique stakeholders for families and schools and healthcare professionals. And, and it's, it's very comprehensive and it does have a section on 504s in it. From Allergy and Asthma Network, 
we have a poster that's anaphylaxis at a glance. We have another poster that outlines all of the epinephrine treatments that are available on the market. Both of these uh, you could post in a school health office easily. We have a book, uh, like a magazine entitled Allergy and Anaphylaxis, Practical Guide for Schools and Family. And this really does outline a full program. We also have Understanding Anaphylaxis. This is a 36-page uh, uh, magazine-style document that is uh, written at a sixth grade reading level. Great thing to share with families if you need it. And then we have two uh, Patient Learning Pathways videos on our website. And, uh, and these are full of the information from the understanding of Flaxus, just delivered in a different way. So right now, we're going to go to the question box and get to some of your questions. So, Ryan, here we go with questions. Sure. The first one is, my smaller parochial school does not have stock epi or inhalers. Parents are required to supply them for their children with the doctor's orders. As a school mm -hmm. nurse, I struggle how to transport them on field trips in the winter when students are outside in temperatures lower than 40 degrees for more than two hours. I went to college in Minnesota. It was less than 40 below sometimes. So it's any suggestions. And uh, you know, certainly um, you'd want to look at the legalities of the private school saying that they didn't want to have stock epinephrine. Ryan, do you have a comment on that at all? Well, my comment on that is that in the public school setting here in Ohio, uh, we do not do that. We all we all have stock epinephrine. It's authorized um, by statute and required in most instances. And so, uh, you know, like I say, pri private schools that don't accept federal funding are, you know, oftentimes they, they don't have to adhere to some of the same standards. In Ohio, that's by state law for public schools. Now, with respect to transport, uh, I recognize certainly that is a concern and, and how do we make sure that that's safe and ready uh, in the event that a student would need it. Uh, you know, I don't know what kind of thermal packaging is available if you can put it um, in sometimes those uh, thermal cases, kind of similar to what you would take uh, hot or cold lunch items in uh, can sometimes maintain temperature depending on how long the trip is. Um, but that that's certainly something that I would look into and make sure that if we're taking those medications with us on a field trip, certainly that they're ready to be used in an emergency situation. Ryan, no one is more resourceful than a school nurse. And I was going to actually bring up a thermal lunch bag myself. And, you know, if you were really worried about it getting too cold uh, and um, you could even put it in a backpack next to someone's body or uh, or even on an inside pocket of a jacket if you were very concerned about it. But epinephrine should be stored at room, basically what would be considered room temperature. Sure. So you're right that you don't want to let it get too cold. Next question, should we worry about soap or lotion containing tree nuts or tree nut oil? Yes, I wouldn't suggest using it around an allergic child because you just don't know uh, what's actually in it. I agree 100%. Okay, here's one. I suffer from many food allergies and I find that people are very ignorant to accommodating them. Having a pre peanut free table is not good enough. The table changes daily and therefore allergies can still be present. Unless you see it, many do not believe it. We came up with some great ways to handle the cafeteria. Uh, one, one school nurse shared with me one time what I thought was brilliant. And there was a, a student desk off to the side that nobody else was allowed to touch or use. And there was a clean placemat that went on that and that got pushed up to what, the end of whatever table the child with the food allergy wanted to eat at. Friends could be right near her, but she was not. It, but they would not touch her space, and she would not touch their food. And I thought that was relatively brilliant. They also make these new lunch bags. I don't know if you've seen them, where they literally open flat into a placemat. They're really cool. Yeah, I, I have seen those. I, I think th those are both great ideas, Sally. The other thing, just to maybe piggyback on that question, and it came up, I think, Sally, in both of our comments today, is you're, that that individual is right uh, about cafeteria concerns and about still uh, today in 2020, some people not understanding the real ramifications of food allergies and allergic reactions. But um, it is really important that if you do introduce food into a classroom, that uh, those 
surfaces be cleaned and sanitized. It's it's not one that um, that food service in the public school setting is responsible for that because it's in a classroom that falls under the custodial job classification. And so it's important that those individuals understand that if food was consumed in a classroom that uh, those surfaces have to be cleaned and sanitized, uh, particularly if there are students with food allergies, but that really should be a, a building-wide practice because you oftentimes don't know uh, where students, particularly younger students, are going to end up. Absolutely. That really segues into our next question. It says, when students go back to school, I have heard that many students may eat lunch in the classrooms. What are your suggestions yeah. if this happens and how to be best prepared? Well, I have to tell you, you want to listen to our June 4th webinar on COVID-19 and reopening of schools because we just wrote the slides today and we're going to approach this in more detail. But the but the thought is is that you know there are accommodations that would have to be made and that you and uh, you're going to want to be thinking about how best to keep an area clean and and everything with again kind of the least number of restrictions possible. And uh, and I think uh, this is one place where I just want to say that uh, I think school nurses really need to think hard about building bridges when they talk to parents and not not uh, saying well we can't do that. I tried very hard to have that never come out of my mouth when I worked in the school health office. And I would rather say, well, you know what would, would likely work really well is something, offer another idea, but really let parents know that you're willing to work with them. And then things usually don't get out of hand to the point where people are calling Ryan to litigate a situation. That's right. You know, and that is, that's a great question and it's hard to, you know, it seems like um, the news on COVID and, and what we're supposed to do and, and what's responsible changes every day. Uh, and it's hard to prepare in those kind of circumstances when you don't really know what to expect or what to anticipate. I know a lot of schools uh, and states in response to the COVID pandemic are looking at shutting down meal service um, and having students eat at their desk. And so one idea um, that I know uh, was discussed on a conference call I had with other school lawyers a couple of weeks ago was even if lunch service wasn't provided, potentially keeping cafeteria seating open for students with food allergies um, and ha having separate tables, you know, depending on what was safe for individual groups of students. But I think it's a, you know, it's a fluid situation. And so it's hard to hard to know what to do in response to COVID today when we don't know what it's going to look like you know, 30 days, 60 days, and so forth, so on down the line from now? Yeah, I think we're going to see the guidance uh, change more than once, but we can only make plans with what we know today. So, uh, so someone's asking the question, how can you determine if a private school accepts federal funds? <laughs> but that's, a, that's a great question. It uh, is a great question. Yeah. One, one way would be um, to ask administration. Um, another way would be to look, uh, there may be information on that through your state department of education, uh, through your state secretary of state, uh, or even through the county auditor's office. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, the auditor's office generally is dealing with tax uh, revenues and so forth, but sometimes you will see um, funds passing through that way. Those are three good resources to start with besides asking the institution itself. Uh, one other way would be to do a public records request um, to that school and just ask them to look for records of federal funding they received for the 1920 school year as an example. Um, those are all ways. There's usually a public record of that stuff somewhere. Sometimes it takes a little bit of digging to find it. And, and understand too, for what it's worth that um, federal funds often pass from the Federal Department of Education to the State Departments of Education for distribution to schools. And so sometimes it can look like state funding, but the dollars are actually coming from the federal government. And if that's the case, then they're subject to the Rehabilitation Act and, and other federal laws like that. Okay, I think this will have to be our last question. Uh, it's the question is our 504 coordinator states that it does if it doesn't interrupt academic learning in the classroom, the student doesn't need a 504. I disagree. How do we resolve this disagreement? I believe every student with the requirement of carrying an epinephrine auto injector should have a 504. Could you expand on this, please? 
Sure. Can, can you give me the first half of that again, Sally? I'm sorry, okay. I missed it. Uh, basically, the school is, the 504 coordinator says that if academic learning is not interrupted, a 504 isn't needed. And I, I'm assuming this is a nurse. I, I don't know for sure. But uh, sure. The, the person asking the question says they think that every student that carries an ep epinephrine auto injector should have a 504. Okay. Yeah, well, I, look, I, I tend to agree with that point. I, you know, I, it, it's hard for me to speak to a specific circumstance, um, just kind of in a vacuum because I don't know all the background and I don't know what, what state they're in and so forth. But I, I tend to agree. I think if a student is carrying around life-saving medication uh, with them, it's because they have a condition um, that uh, could endanger their life. And a student with a diagnosed food allergy that puts his life in danger should be on a 504 plan, even if the 504 plan says, hey, you know, student can participate uh, uh, as ordinary uh, so long as carrying auto injector or words to that effect. I agree that that should be in a 504 plan. It, and look, for one thing, it, it helps to uh, protect the district, actually, then if if an issue comes up um, where the student needs to administer epinephrine, um, you know, it's helpful to have that document in place that says, hey, that that student was authorized to carry it, that student was responsible to be carrying it, that epinephrine should have been available uh, or was available for that incident. And so generally, uh, I tend to agree with that thinking, but like I say, I can't speak to the specifics of that circumstance. Well, I'll tell you what, one, one thing we used to do, we knew our elementary school was gonna give every student every accommodation that they really needed. And we never ended up really having any problems with parents, but we kept writing 504s whenever they went to the middle school because we were concerned that uh, what we did might not be followed through on. So uh, yeah. so every situation takes its own, um, it kind of has its own life. So Ryan, I wanna thank you so much for being with us here today. Loved what you had to share. Thanks so much. It, my pleasure. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of it, Sally. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, I'd like to thank all our listeners and please join us in July for our next five things to know. You can register for this webinar on the, our homepage uh, at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Uh, you can uh, look right down the page and there'll be a, a, a big area that's all put, put there just for webinars. And, uh, and you can re listen to all of our archived webinars there. We record every webinar we do. So thanks for joining us today, and we hope you've learned five new things. This is Sally Schessler, and for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, I'd like to thank you for being with us, and we hope that you have a safe and a healthy day. Thank you.